we do want to dive into some more of these international headlines. And I think a lot of people are wondering whether or not foreign policy was an issue that led you to the ballot box. Uh, how Donald Trump and J.D. Vance might approach the wars in Ukraine and Gaza here. Let's talk about that with national security analyst and expert, our friend, retired Marine intelligence officer, Hal Kempfer. He joins me. Uh, Hal, it's good to be with you uh, yet again here. Uh, you and I have been on somewhat of a hiatus because of the very busy political season, though don't you worry, our viewers had your conversations with my colleague Austin Westfall, no doubt here, about something similar too from, from last night. We wanna move that conversation forward a little bit here. Let's first focus our efforts, Hal, uh, on the war in Ukraine. The Wall Street Journal, they had this reporting today about how the Trump transition team is signaling what approach they might take to that war there, what proposals they might present to, say, Zelensky and or Putin here. I'm reading from the Wall Street Journal right now. They say this, uh, that essentially uh, that the White House also, though, is planning to rush, uh, excuse me, the White House is planning to rush uh, the last of over $6 billion remaining in Ukraine's security mm -hmm. assistance uh, out the door by the time the Trump administration comes in here. Uh, so I thought that was interesting, what the Biden administration is essentially doing to quote unquote, Trump proof some of that military aid and assistance for Ukraine here. Uh, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but essentially the Wall Street Journal report was saying uh, that they're putting together to enact some kind of buffer zone in the east of Ukraine uh, to stall force action there. What do you make of that? Well, as a, Andrew, it's an interesting article. And, uh, and one thing I will say is, there, there has been some Trump proofing going on for some time, uh, obviously with NATO and the European Union. In fact, this week, coincidentally, there's an EU conference being held in uh, Budapest, which is uh, basically after the, and it's going this week, so it, it fell on the heels of the election, which means that the discussion today was all about uh, what are they gonna do going forward with Trump coming in. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about that, a lot about getting all the rest of that aid that has been already approved by Congress out the door by the time that President Trump takes office. And, and interestingly, there's also a lot of discussion, a lot of pressure. It's not clear to me how much of that is within the principles of the administration to change our policy on use of weapons and, and directly citing not just uh, President Trump coming into office, or back in office, I should say, but also citing the fact you got North Korean troops yeah. literally on Ukrainian territory and they're being targeted by Ukraine and saying, look, let's lift all the restrictions. And I think part of the idea there is, is you, you change these policies, you get all the aid out the door, and these are things that uh, if, if President Trump wants to change it, he's gonna have to go back and change the policy to something else. Now, I will point out one thing with this, which is really interesting. Uh, John Thune, Senator Thune, who you who you were just talking about, is one of the uh, top runners to be, you know, uh, the the next uh, uh, Senate Majority Leader. Uh, was doing an interview yesterday and was wearing a U.S. and Ukrainian flag on his uh, on his lapel when he when he did that. And I I thought that was an interesting visual signal, and and certainly uh, Speaker Johnson has also been uh, very. Uh, very forceful in his support for Ukraine. So whatever the president does, he's gonna have to work with Congress uh, on this. And uh, it, it's pretty clear that on both sides of the, you know, uh, both houses, I should say, there's a lot of support for Ukraine. Yeah. And so there will be a negotiation. And of course, you know, Donald Trump is, you know, he, he kind of does negotiation. That's kind of how he got famous. Sure. So all throughout the campaign, Hal. Right, there's gonna be a lot there. Yeah, all throughout the campaign, Hal, uh, Trump had said that the war in Ukraine would never have started if he was still president. Now I have in front of me finally uh, the piece in the Wall Street Journal, uh, and this is more specifics of the plan the Trump transition team is uh, proposing here. One idea they say proposed uh, was this. It would involve Kyiv promising not to join NATO for at least 20 years uh, in exchange, yeah. the U.S. would continue to pump Ukraine full of weapons to deter a future Russian attack. Uh, also, under the plan, the front line would essentially lock in place, and both sides would agree to an 800-mile demilitarized zone 
Uh, who would police that territory remains unclear in this plan, according to this piece. Uh, one advisor, though, saying this to the Wall Street Journal, that the peacekeeping force would not involve American troops nor come from a U.S.-funded international body like the United Nations here. So uh, we have a multi-pronged plan being put forth by the Trump transition team. Are these good ideas? They're, they're new approaches. Would you advocate these ideas or not? Well, personally, no, I would not. I don't think they're going to go anywhere. And, I, oh. and President Zelensky was very articulate today. And uh, he used the term concessions, but basically in so many words, he says, look, we're not, we're not going to concede sovereign Ukrainian territory. So he was very clear on that. The, the thing I'd point out, and you and I have talked about this in the past, is that uh, Putin himself has not appeared to be particularly amenable to uh, these types of discussions either. In fact, he just said something recently that uh, indicates he, he's still full on with his war aims of uh, pushing across Ukraine. So uh, there would have to be a lot of changes. Uh, I have heard J.D. Vance uh, articulate these uh, very proposals, the idea of freezing them in place. There's other proposals out there about some sort of pullback in certain territory. Uh, that wasn't in that one, but that's, you know, these are, these are various levels of negotiation that could yeah. take place. So it, it's 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 all possible. One thing that is happening, though, the U.S. has taken the, the lion's share of the coordination, if you will, the right. logistics coordination uh, of all these countries, not just the U.S., but other countries sending aid into uh, using using the uh, offices of the European U.S. European Command, uh, using some of their capability there uh, to push aid into Ukraine. That is getting more multilateral, if you will. It's getting okay. more NATO-wise, and that's something you're going to see really get put on the on the on the burner uh, for the next couple of months because they're going to try and make sure that, that if something does happen there, that NATO could pick up the load if the I U.S. See. pulls back some of its support. So, Hal, I'm I'm quoting from the piece as well. This was a member of Trump's team saying this to the Wall Street Journal. "Quote: We can do training." and other support, but the barrel of the gun is going to be European. We're not sending American men and women to uphold peace in Ukraine, and we're not paying for it. Get the Poles, Germans, British, and French to do it. Now, this is something that has, frankly, confounded me uh, throughout the duration of the war in Ukraine from critics of American support for it. There has never been any mention uh, of sending Americans into Ukraine for any purpose. So you have some of these members of the Trump team, you know, starting any dialogue uh, about that war with this caveat, why? Well, let me just say this. Uh, it kind of gets to the art of the deal, all right? Um, they've thrown that down there as a, as, a, as a placeholder, saying we're not gonna send US troops to fight the war in Ukraine, all right? Well. It, 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 there has been some talk out there that with North Koreans coming in, that maybe NATO troops could come in or the troops from NATO countries could come in to offset that. That has been, uh, I would say, sidebar discussions. I've never heard any formal proposal to that, but I have heard some politicians kind of throw that out there. But here's the thing. In, in the negotiation, you throw that out and say, we're not going to send troops out there. All right. That's an easy one. To, uh, to put down a, as a marker because we don't have any troops there. We've never said we are sending troops there, but you can throw that down as a marker I and see. it gives you something to negotiate about. And I have to tell you, that is kind of a classic Trump negotiation technique, if you will, that he's used in real estate over the many years, which is throw down something as something you can negotiate around or negotiate with that really isn't something that costs you anything or you have to give up anything in order to do it. So when I saw that thrown out there, I go, oh, there you go. There's that classic negotiation technique he's used so many times in the past. And, and I'm not saying it's a good technique or a bad technique. It's just what he's always done. He'll throw out something that there really isn't anything there or there. But you can say, we're not going to send troops in, and that's a concession you know, to, to what we're saying. Well, it's easy to say because, well, frankly, we, are not, we don't have troops there. We're not planning on sending troops there. So it's easy right. to negotiate that point. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting negotiating tactic. I mean, he, he's drawing, they are drawing a line in the sand for something that's not even in consideration, which I thought was interesting here. Um, Hal, while we have you, let's just move from Europe to the Middle East briefly here. Uh, we have a live picture there. 
in southern Israel, I believe, right now looking into the Gaza Strip. You sent this over to me, some comments from former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta about some of the predictions he's making for how Trump will treat the Middle East. Panetta saying Trump will, as president, give Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a blank check in the Middle East, possibly opening the way for all-out war between Israel and Iran. Uh, Panetta said that the blank check will, whatever you do, whatever you want to do, whoever you want to go after, you have my blessing. I mean, he basically said that before the election, uh, kind of referring to inciting Donald Trump here. Um, what is, I guess, the calculus in the Middle East when Trump will take over? Uh, and will Netanyahu use this lame duck period, this interim period, kind of like he's already been doing, uh, to accomplish some of the aims and advantages and tasks that he has been so far? Will he continue to do that under Trump? Will it be kind of this reckless abandonment uh, of some of these priorities that the Israelis have? I, I think what it does is it, it, it releases Netanyahu from some concerns he had with the Biden administration, and certainly what would have been a, if there if if Harris had been elected, would have been an incoming Harris administration, that they would pull back support, that they would put more conditions and constraints on what he could do uh, in, in every theater, whether it's uh, in Gaza, Lebanon, or dealing with Iran direct. So in that regard, uh, he doesn't have to worry about that. Trump has always been uh, very supportive uh, across the board. The other thing to also remember is uh, that President Trump had a very good relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, and some other Arab countries in there. These are primarily Sunni uh, Arab countries. And I just remind our, our viewers that Iran is uh, primarily a Shiite uh, Muslim country and the Sunni Shiite divide is a very real thing uh, in the Middle East. And, uh, and so what you find is in saying that and in, in confronting and allowing our Israel to confront Iran more directly and more freely, that does uh, support some of the strategic objectives, if you will, of countries like the UAE and Saudi Arabia and some others who also would like to see Iran's power and influence in the region uh, dramatically curtailed. So I think that's something that that is is very much has to be appreciated with this uh, across the board. But uh, but it is interesting. You know, there's uh, three things I would point out uh, on election day. One of the big constraints within within uh, Netanyahu's cabinet was uh, Yoav Gallant, his defense minister, whom right. he fired on election day, all right? So he's gone. Uh, the other part was Biden, you know, putting constraints on him. Uh, well, now that's been mitigated. I'm not saying it's fully gone, uh, but that's been changed. And it's not a new Harris administration carrying on the same policy coming in. But one thing I would point out is next week on the 13th of November, that will be the 30 days. Remember, we put a, the U.S. Uh, told them, look, you've got to dramatically increase the amount of aid going into the right. Gaza Strip. And we put stipulations on that. And, and frankly, Israel hasn't come even close to meeting what we asked them to do. Okay. Uh, well, on the 13th, that'll be the end of the 30 days. The Biden administration's got to make a decision. Are they going to actually do something? Are they going to withhold military aid from Israel? as they said or as they threatened they would do or are they just going to ignore it that i think next week's going to be very telling and then of course uh if the biden administration does that uh i would imagine that the moment that president trump is uh, inaugurated he's going to basically turn that around 180 degrees but uh but it is interesting those are three things and that's that thing next week that's real whether regardless of the election you know the results that's a real thing. You know, President Biden is still the president for two more months. Yeah, that's right. And so that is a very real thing that, that they're going to have to uh, deal with. Yeah, and of course, uh, Bibi Netanyahu was the first world leader to congratulate Donald Trump yes. uh, after his election victory Tuesday night. We also know uh, Trump uh, and Saudi Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman had a phone call uh, as well. Uh, Hal Kempfer, as always, uh, thanks so much for your insight. We'll definitely be chatting soon, Hal. Okay, thank you, Andrew.